In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount in St. Matthew's Gospel follows on our Lord's proclamation that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then proceeds to unfold the ways of that kingdom to his disciples. The union of heaven and earth had not been known since the time of the Garden of Eden, when the whole creation was made by God to be his dwelling place. Adam and Eve's rebellion had resulted in their creating a space in which they could try to live without communion with God, a space the scriptures would later call the world. God permitted Adam and Eve to dwell in that awful space where they could imagine hiding from God and providing for themselves without God. But it was a little world in which God also allowed them to experience what the scriptures would later call vanity, the experience of the creation as it would be if God's provision and love were neither sought nor known. Vanity is an airiness that seems substantial, a cloudiness that deceives us into thinking it is more solid than it is. Nothing proved quite enough in this world of vanity. Nothing proved substantial or satisfying. After all the toil required to uphold the delusion that men could live without God, all they had to show for it was scarcity, bitterness, injustice, alienation, shame, and death. In the place of providence, the best available replacement was management. In the place of grace and mercy, all they could find was exchange and debt. On a long enough timeline, they were tempted to swap integrity for and righteousness for the means of control and the illusion of self-sufficiency found in things like political expedience and market superiority even as they were ruined by these temptations at every turn. What Jesus calls mammon in the gospel lesson is an Aramaic term referring to the false gods and currency of that world turned inward on itself. Ultimately, the conflict of God and mammon admits of no middle ground. We cannot live as though we are not gods, while desiring to enjoy the good and lasting things that he has given for our good. Humanity has been faced with the choice at every moment to choose between life as known in communion with God or death in the world that we insist is our own. We all know the outcome. Rather than admitting this isn't enough, or, more truthfully, I am not enough. Humanity continually recommits itself to the toil, knowing in their hearts that it is ultimately futile. And from the ground of that outward ambition combined with that gnawing, self-turned skepticism, and ultimately despair, grew the awful weed of what the scriptures call anxiety anxiousness, or worry. Anxiousness in the scriptures is not the same thing as anxiety as we might find it in a diagnostic manual. It is a condition of the heart, the name of which derives from an ancient word that means to choke. Anxiousness is the creeping sense of pressure that the world is against us both from the outside and from the inside resulting in a slow but certain sense of being strangled, of being less and less able to breathe, of the margins of life growing thinner, and of the slow diminishing of our youthful sense that we can keep up with it all. What our Lord confronts in the gospel lesson today is not a sometimes crippling cognitive or neurological condition that afflicts some, but rather the general condition of those grappling with the insufficiency of our little rebel world, 
a condition that affects all of us to some extent. We know deep down that we cannot be enough of ourselves for ourselves and that our systems for managing life are at best provisional and failing. At the same time, we bitterly resist the terms of self-surrender and humility required to live at peace in God's good world. So, as our Lord proclaims that his his Father in heaven is drawing all things to himself and is closing the age of that world, the critical question then becomes how this new life in the kingdom that our Lord offers us meets us and redeems us from the anxiousness of the world. In our gospel lesson, Jesus repeats his command not to worry, not to be anxious three times. And also three times, he offers us a replacement for that worry that draws us more completely away from the gravity of the world's anxiousness. First, in the place of worry, Jesus invites his disciples to look at. This is, of course, very different from just taking in the data collected by the eyes. To look at, in our Lord's sense, is a return to what we might call attentiveness, a disciplining of the wandering eyes that range over the world as though it were an undifferentiated mass of sensory stimuli. To look at is to stay put for a time, which pulls us away from being the little meerkats that we often are, on the lookout for the next threat, or looking for the next hole to dart into. To look at is a practice of remembering that it is okay to stay still, even though it means the end of our beloved multitasking and the sense of control and power it bestows. To look at requires a trust that we do not always have to look over our shoulders. And to look at the birds, as our Lord specifically commands us, requires that we look up. Unable, perhaps at this point, to look for God directly just yet, we can still always look up to see the birds, the sky, the stars. Yet the birds if we were to look at them, they draw our attention back down again to see that they have to descend from the air to find their homes and to find their provision for life. They do not find their daily bread flapping anxiously on the air. Jesus' second command is to consider. Having looked up, we can then look back down to our own sphere of life, though without danger of retreating and turning back inward to ourselves. To consider means to look alongside, to be informed, and to be formed by. Once we have learned to attend with discipline against distraction, we are made able to observe over time how life unfolds delicately in wild places how fragile lilies grow over time, even though the elements are often harsh. And that springtime, where the lilies bloom, brings up new life from the dead winter soil. To consider invites us into the long view of life, that there are seasons, that there are patterns to inform our expectations of life coming from where we least expect it. Having looked up to see the birds and how their provision comes from God but requires them to get back down to earth, we're now able to consider how life comes from below. And especially when it is rooted, it grows back up again tall and beautiful. To look and consider together rehabilitate our ability to see the world and our life in it. Looking out from ourselves gives us a healthy self-forgetfulness that then returns us to ourselves. In listening to Jesus' instruction, we are restored to life in God's world and to know it, maybe for the first time, as an icon of his love. It is then that Jesus offers his third command, to seek, 
and to seek the kingdom. If we followed him to this point, we'll no longer seek the kingdom as a band-aid to our wounded life in the world. It is possible, after all, for Christians to get stuck in their anxiousness while trying to grasp for a piecemeal redemption. And to the extent that we try to retain life of ourselves and for ourselves in the world, there, will, there we will continue to experience a tremendous and besetting anxiousness. Like the world, the kingdom will have all of us, not part of us. We cannot, in the end, serve both. When we seek as the natural fruit of looking and considering, though, we will begin to seek the kingdom as its own life, one that we leave something behind in order to apprehend. We are made able to see again so that we might begin to see what God has always been quietly offering us, the good world of new life with him that is ours, if we will but receive it. As C.S. Lewis remarked to a friend in a letter just five months before his own death, quote, has this world been so kind to you that you should leave it with regret? There are better things ahead than any we leave behind. This is the righteousness of the kingdom that Jesus speaks of, that we are completely given to it with an undivided heart. But God is gracious and as we proclaim in the collect, he knows that we are too frail, that we are too habituated to the world's ways, and too beset by anxious distraction to rescue ourselves. And so he offers us again, in his teaching in the gospel, the creation to serve our good, as Adam and Eve in the garden. And then he instructs us to stop with him for a bit in the flurry of life to see again, what he has made good for our sake. This is much of our growth as Christians, to receive the spirit of God in our inmost self, who calls us always first to be still and to attend, to taste and to see that the Lord is good, and then leads us out to minister to those still in the grips of the anxiousness of the world. If you have not done so yet, I encourage you to begin this work of the heart as you hope to serve the Lord and to, and to love your neighbor. This week, find something that makes you look above you and remember that God is yet higher and yet does not neglect to provide. Find something that makes you look below you and remember that God upholds your life from beneath every foundation and makes new life to spring up even from hidden places. And in remembering this way that you are loved and upheld from above and beneath, look out from yourself to seek some small way that the Lord might be calling you away from that constrained and choked up life of anxiousness into the good air of trusting and knowing that you are the beloved children of his Father in heaven. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we put on? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.